The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. More than 500 women are currently suing USA Gymnastics. This is the largest sex abuse scandal in American sports history. In a doctor's world exclusive. He abused me hundreds of times. The doctors reveal horrific new details as we go inside the training room of terror. He started by taping ankles, shin splints, and that progressed to... That's today. The gymnasts of Team USA inspire the nation and capture our hearts in Olympics after Olympics. Nobody suspected that behind the perfect tens and sparkling smiles were decades of dark and disturbing secrets. A woman accusing Larry Nasser of sexually abusing her takes the stand, and a judge says it's enough to send the doctor to trial. I remember him putting his hand between my legs and inserting his finger. In a trial that could carry up to life in prison for the former MSU and USA Gymnastics team doctor. More than 130 women and girls, many of them former athletes, claim he sexually abused them under the impression that he was using medical techniques. Nasser faces more than 20 first-degree criminal sexual conduct charges. How do you plead? I'm guilty of state of being. Larry Nasser admits to sexually assaulting young women and girls. Judge Rosemary Aquilina sentenced Larry Nasser to 40 to 175 years. I just find your death warrant. Your decision to assault was devious, despicable. You played on everyone's vulnerability. The judge told Nasser his fate after seven days of listening to more than 150 of his victims make impact statements about how the abuse has affected their lives. Today we're revealing new developments in the sexual abuse scandal that rocked USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University. We're joined by two of the brave survivors, Olympic medalist Jamie Dancher and Sarah Klein. Thank you both so much for being here. Welcome. I also want to welcome investigative journalists John Barr and Dan Murphy, who unravel how the abuse went on for so very long in their new book called Start by Believing. Gentlemen, I just want to ask you, because you interviewed 150 plus individuals to write this book, what sort of new information did you guys uncover? Well, the biggest thing for us is we really had a, got a deeper understanding of just the lengths USA Gymnastics went to in order to conceal this story. In the summer of 2015, when they had credible evidence that women were sexually assaulted, they took active steps to not reveal the truth, to bury it. And through documents that haven't been released before, through dozens of interviews with USA Gymnastics staffers, current and former, we were able to document how this organization was more concerned about protecti protecting its own reputation than the women in their charge. Before we dig a little deeper into the cover-up, I really would love to give everyone a sense for the personal turmoil that you two have been through. But even before we go there, I'll openly admit that, that when I watch what you two do as gymnasts, I'm in awe. Jamie, can you first just talk about what it's like to compete at that high of a level? Uh, well, it was extremely abusive, actually, on a daily basis. Um, mentally, physically, and emotional abusive pretty much every day of my life. And to the point where it was like training as an elite, which was obviously one of my dreams, became a, more like a nightmare. Um, they controlled what I ate. They controlled, they wanted me to stand a certain way. They wanted my hair a certain way. Uh, we weren't allowed to talk. They basically stripped me of like my entire personality. And I was even afraid to tell them when I was injured and because they didn't believe me. So I had to work through like broken bones and compete on broken bones. And then on top of that, they wanted me to eat only like less than a thousand calories a day. Um, and then train for almost seven hours a day. And I even, when I started my period at 16, uh, my coach told me that I wouldn't have started my period if I, if I didn't have enough, if I didn't have that much body fat. And Jamie, when you say they, is this the, in, the entire team? I mean, I know there's the head of the program, but there's so many assistants, there's a whole hierarchy. Nobody stood up and said, this is not right. No, it was, 
And those were my own personal coaches that I was training with every day. Was there a point when it shifted from being something that you enjoyed or you wanted to pursue to being something that became, as you said, a nightmare? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was 11 years old when I started training an elite, as an elite, and that's where the shift came. It was like I had such a love for it, and then I started disliking it, and then it just became like this love-hate relationship to just hate. I'm curious because I think a part of this that a lot of people struggle with is, you know, when it came to your parents, for instance, were they aware of what you were going through or were they pretty much shielded from it? They were pretty much, I mean, they were encouraged not to watch practice, even at like some gyms where are not even allowed to watch practice wow. at the elite level. So they really, they really pushed the parents out and, you know, being conditioned not to speak up and not really have an opinion, I, I didn't, I didn't understand the severity of the abuse at that time. I just thought it was, I hated it, but it was, I thought it was difficult and that's what it was gonna take to get to the Olympics. I mean, well, and that's Judy, how they can create this type of culture of abuse is just isolating you from your loved ones, people who might be able to say, this isn't right. Yeah. This is not what we signed up for. Yeah. And after a while, it's not just you guys who are being brainwashed. Anybody who's indoctrinated into this organization working for you guys, anybody on the team, they're all on the same page. And nobody is going to speak up Judy, because there's so much on the line. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sick to my stomach yes. hearing this story. I mean, this, this poor woman, her childhood, her normal growth as a kid, having fun being a kid, mm -hmm. was essentially taken away from her right. by, this, by this program. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, too, you never develop a sense of self. Because I started gymnastics when I was five. Yeah. How old were you? Seven. Seven. Right. So you never develop a sense of right or wrong, of boundaries, and you're, you're asked to give your body and your psyche away to a grown adult male, your coach. So you learn from a very early age to just dissociate and never to develop a voice. And I think that plays a big part in what allowed all of this to happen with Larry Nassar. So you can look back now as adults and see it for what it is, but when you're seven years old, and you're indoctrinated into it, it's just your normal. I felt like a robot, and I felt like that's exactly what they were trying to create, was a machine. Before we get into the abuse that you two dealt with, as well as so many others with, with Nasser, I wanna talk briefly, gentlemen, about the culture, because what I'm hearing here is this is a toxic culture. Can you just talk a little bit about, in, in all of your interviews, the toxic culture, quite frankly, from the coaching staff down? Yeah, I think it started with Bella and Marta Caroli. They are by no means the only coaches that engaged in abusive behavior, but we documented through speaking with members of the Romanian national team, the former uh, members of the Romanian national team, that they were just flat out physically abused. Uh, one woman shares a story about Bella Caroli striking her with an open hand, knocking her off her feet onto, onto the bed because her mother had left her a loaf of bread on her journey to the Crowley's training facility. Another describes being so deprived of food that she put toothpaste in her mouth just so she could have the sensation of something with flavor in her mouth. This is a, a woman who would take a jar and put food in it and put it in the toilet tank and hide it in the water so that she'd have something to eat when nobody was looking. She picked apples out of the garbage. I mean, this is, and this is what was going on. Mm -hmm. These people came to the United States and they were essentially handed the keys to the U.S. national program. Shortly after the Carolis got to the U.S., they started coaching Mary Lou Retton, who became the face that, that really took U the U.S. Olympic gymnast team from a, a, someone who participated in the Olympics but was not what it is today into a world power. And that happened under the Carolis. And they did build U.S. into a, the U.S. into the world power in gymnastics, but at what cost? Yeah. At what cost? And I want to talk about that on the other side of the break, because when we come back, we're going to discuss how the abuse escalated to sexual abuse. 
coming up. We were sent to this back room in our gym, no access to the back room by parents or anybody else. And he started by taping ankles, shin splints, and that very quickly progressed to massage, and he began penetrating us. Plus. He abused me, I mean, hundreds of times. And in my mind, I thought he was helping me and fixing my back. That's coming up. We're talking to journalists John Barr and Dan Murphy, whose new book, Start by Believing, investigates the largest sex abuse scandal in American sports history. Two of the survivors, Jamie Dancher and Sarah Klein, also join us recounting their stories. And Sarah, we've been talking a little bit about the toxic culture. Can you talk about the first time that you were actually abused by Nasser? Yeah, so I started uh, gymnastics when I was five years old. And by eight years old, I started competing. And Nasser arrived uh, at our gym as an athletic trainer. He was not yet a doctor, and he was not yet even in medical school. And we were sent to this back room in our gym, no access uh, to the back room by parents or anybody else. Um, and he started by taping ankles, shin splints, very simple things. And that very quickly progressed to massage, um, treating, you know, injuries, and shortly thereafter, you know, it was, can you take your leotard down? I need to access this part of your back. Can you pull your leotard up? I need to access this part of your body to, can you please take your leotard off? And he began penetrating us um, very early on. And Sarah, you spoke specifically in your victim impact statement about how he would disguise the assault as medicine. So can you tell us how he was able to do that? Yeah, Larry was very great at giving technical explanations, and he would speak the entire time he was treating you. So he would say, I'm going to loosen this ligament, and now I'm going to massage this muscle and release this. Um, and so it all, you know, sounded really legitimate. And, and he used medical terms into an eight-year-old. <laughs> And is this why he would be digitally penetrating you? Absolutely. At eight years of age? I need to release this muscle. I need to align your tailbone. I need to release your hips and loosen up your, you know, groin area. It all sounded so very legitimate. You had no idea what was really going on. Absolutely at no that idea. Age, which is he wasn't obviously even a doctor at this point. He was not yet a doctor. No, he was a volunteer athletic trainer. He walked into the gym and said, "I want to volunteer. It's going to look good on my medical school applications." But some thing that I find very interesting is Larry Nassar received a varsity letter as a high school student for women's gymnastics. So how far back this fetish wow. with young women and, and women in leotards started um, was high school. I'll also mention Larry was a lovely human being. He was, I describe him to be like a Labrador puppy. The, the smiliest, kindest, always had a hug, always had something kind to say. He was the good cop to our coach's bad cop. And so he was very loved. And he also groomed our parents. Our parents loved him. Our families loved him. He, you know, came to our birthday parties and brought us gifts. And I went to his wedding. I was a guest at his wedding. He was he was part of the family. He he was one of the most formative male figures in our lives and the kindest. My my experience was a little different than that because he, I I was 12 years old when I made national team, and I met him very early on. And he I remember him giving me my first physical and looking back I now what I know is abuse he abused me the first time I met him um, and for me it was more like I trusted him number one because he's a doctor and he was also the team doctor that had worked with all these other Olympians mm -hmm. and now it's a privilege I get to work with Larry Nasser. I get to work with him like so from day one I trusted him and then... So by this point in time, he was a doctor. Yes, and then on top of that, he was, he was nice. He was like my buddy. He, he told jokes. He allowed me to have a personality that I was never allowed to have. He snuck me food and candy when I was hungry. And I felt like he was on my side. So every time, you know, I had treatment and he was abusing me, like, I, I never thought Larry would do anything to hurt me. Mm -hmm. I thought he was helping me pursue my dream and helping me get to the Olympics. Can you talk about how he would make you feel that way, but then also talk about how in these sessions they were always unsupervised? My hips started going out, like, out of alignment at a very young age. 
and he had told me that I was, I was butt dumb, and meaning that I don't use my butt muscles and my abs together. And I, I think that's probably <laughs> accurate. I, I mean, I believed it, I was so young, but he abused me, I mean, hundreds of times. Right. And in my mind, I thought he was helping me and fixing my back. Under a guise of pelvic floor therapy, talking you through the medicine, and, and pelvic floor therapy Number one, should never be done unsupervised, should not be done on minors, should never be done without a glove, and would not be done for this type of therapy, period. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so disconcerting is that, you know, we went to medical school, and you, you learn in medical school how to use reassuring words when you're doing something that is legitimate. And it's almost what I'm hearing is that he was using these tools mm -hmm. to convince you that what was going on was medically necessary, medically mm -hmm. legitimate. And, and the hard part is, 12 when this started, I never how, questioned how would you it. ever know? I, I never questioned it. But he was also given so much, so much power in, in any situation. This didn't just happen in, in, in a doctor's office or an exam room. I mean, he was treating me at the, at the ranch in my own bed that I slept in in the cabin. And he was allowed that access to us, whether I was alone in my own bed or, you know, my teammate was in the other bed next to me. He was allowed to do that. That's, I mean, and same thing happened at the Olympics. Coming up. I go to his apartment. He asked me to do the middle splits so he can measure the distance between my pelvic bone and the floor. And then said as my reward, I could get a full body massage right there in his apartment. Plus. And there were so many times that I wanted to quit. I mean, I, I really did hate it, but I still had a dream to be an Olympian. And there was no other way to get to the Olympics besides working with Larry Nassar. That's coming up. More than 130 women and girls, many of them former athletes, claim he sexually abused them under the impression that he was using medical techniques. The judge told Nasser his fate after seven days of listening to more than 150 of his victims make impact statements about how the abuse has affected their lives. We're talking to journalists John Barr and Dan Murphy, whose new book, Start by Believing, investigates the largest sex abuse scandal in American sports history. Two of the survivors, Jamie Dancher and Sarah Klein, also join us. I understand, Sarah, you have a story where you were a part of an experiment actually at his house. Yeah, he called my house and, and made me feel really special that I was asked to go to his house to mm -hmm. participate in a Michigan State study, which is where he attended uh, med uh, medical school. So I go to his apartment, one bedroom apartment. He's in his late 20s, and he asked me to do the middle splits so he can measure the distance between my pelvic bone and the floor. He then asked me to take off my leotard and take a bath in his bathtub and heat up my muscles. He brought in magazines, USA Gymnastics magazines, for me to read while I was nude in his bathtub. I then got out, did the splits again. He wanted to see if my muscles were looser. And so he measured, uh, measured me again and then said as my reward, he couldn't pay me, but I could get a full body massage right there in his apartment. He had a treatment table set up in his apartment and he proceeded to give me a full body massage and anally and vaginally penetrate me in his house, and I was 12 years old. And, and Sarah, I just want to pause, and just listening to all these details is just so disgusting that he basically made it a prize. A prize. For and, him to sexually assault you. And I felt special, and I felt we all went back to the gym and said, did you guys get a call from Larry? Did you get a call right. from Larry? Right. And those who were chosen felt amazing, and those who were not chosen felt awful. You know, what blows my mind, too, is as this is happening, obviously, you didn't really know it was abuse. It no. felt special. It felt good. But, Jamie, I have a question for you, because you had had this happen to you hundreds of times, and yet you were still performing. You were still doing what you were supposed to do as a gymnast. How did you guys do this? I, I, it was, it was hard. I mean, there were so many times that I wanted to quit. I mean, I, I really did hate it, but I also felt like I felt stuck, you know? I had already put so much time and effort in and my family had and made sacrifices. And, you know, I, I still had a dream to be an Olympian. Mm -hmm. And there was no other way to get to the Olympics besides 
working with national team staff and Larry Nassar. There was no other way to get through it. And Sarah, what about you? Did you feel like at some point your joy was robbed also, that your passion had changed? Yeah, I think for me it was a little bit different because I was a recreational gymnast. I was competing and I was good, but I wasn't on an Olympic path. Um, but Larry was the trainer in my home gym in Lansing, Michigan, and so I received his treatment three or four times a week, every week, every year, starting at eight years old. And the last time I was treated by Larry Nassar, I was 25 years old. So 17 years of abuse, and I was brainwashed at such a young age, I, I literally knew nothing else and he was such an incredible figure in my life and so you know a positive part of my childhood that I would never imagine that he would be hurting me and it sounded so medically viable and he and he purported to care so deeply about us that it did not even dawn on me can we talk a little bit about that hurt and now you two sit here as grown adults and can you talk a little bit about the challenges as you've gone through your lives since you recognize this abuse and just the, the trials and tribulations of, of dealing with that. Coming up. I had so much anxiety and severe depression. I suffered from eating disorders. At one point I did have a suicide attempt. Plus. I had two full pelvic reconstructive surgeries. And when my doctor came in my room after the surgery, he said, you have one of the worst cases I've ever seen. I have to ask you, have you ever been sexually abused? That's coming up. Can we talk a little bit about that hurt? And now you two sit here as grown adults. And can you talk a little bit about the challenges as you've gone through your lives? since you recognize this abuse and just the, the trials and tribulations of dealing with that? Before I recognized that I was sexually abused, um, I had gone to therapy, you know, when I, was, when I was in college. And for the mental, emotional, and physical abuse that I endured in gymnastics. But when, once I graduated, um, I definitely felt lost. Um, I had so much anxiety and severe depression. I suffered from eating disorders, even, you know, after I was done with gymnastics. Um, I was so depressed at one point, I, like, I did have a suicide attempt and ended up in the hospital. And it was, the difficult part about that for me was, like, everybody on the outside couldn't understand, like, why. And they, like, asked me, like, what is wrong with you? You're an Olympian and you're, you have a degree. And, like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you just get your life together? And I, felt like I was crazy. In late summer 2016, that's when I realized um, that Larry had sexually abused me. And when I started learning about child childhood trauma and how that can affect you as an adult, that's when I felt like, okay, I'm not I'm not crazy. Finally you know, I thought, you. yeah, it finally makes sense for you know, why I just couldn't get my life together and, was, was and how that affected me as an adult. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis everything you went through, I mean, you're talking about psychological ac aspects and eating disorders. W was it difficult for you to deal with men as you were getting older? Yeah, I've been in several abusive relationships that, you know, my threshold for abuse is way too high. Um, but that, that's why I, I go to therapy twice well, a week, you know. One of the things that Sarah mentioned is that you didn't have the boundaries. You didn't have mm -hmm. the appropriate boundaries put on. You didn't learn that the appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And as a child, even when you're abused, and even if you don't consciously know it, it's terrible that it is something that manifests all throughout your body and your mind. Yeah. Yeah. We know that there's a lot of research that shows that people who have been abused, even when they don't recognize that it's abuse, later on in life, they're more likely to develop PTSD, depression, bulimia, and anorexia. Mm -hmm. And your brain changes profoundly. Children who are sexually abused have changes in their brain structures, in the way that their brain functions, the connectivity, the elevations in cortisol. We know this all from research. And so you didn't have to know that to have all of these deleterious experiences as adults and not knowing where it came from. Yeah. Because you guys were high level performing teenagers, children. And then as adults, it's like you lost your way and you didn't know why that happened. Yeah. And yeah. It, it really all goes back to the extensive abuse that you've all suffered. Yeah, I had major physical manifestations of abuse, but I didn't know why. So for me, um, I began withdrawing from life, similar to Jamie. And 
people that, you know, knew me, friendships would say, you know, kind of what's going on with you. And my body actually started attacking itself. And so I had massive pelvic pain. I sought out the, the nation's best endometriosis surgeon, and I had two full pelvic reconstructive surgeries. And when my doctor came in my room after the surgery, he said, I've been doing this close to 30 years. All I do is endometriosis surgery, and you have one of the worst cases I've ever seen. It's stage four, and I had to reconstruct your entire pelvis, taking large amounts of your ovaries out. And this was before I was a mother, losing large parts of my ovaries. And he said, I have to ask you, have you ever been sexually abused? And I said, no. Right, because you, you still didn't believe it no. then. In yeah. my early 30s, 33 years old, I said no. Mm. It, it hadn't even dawned on me. Right. And I said no. And, and then I was diagnosed with Graves' disease, a thyroid disorder, autoimmune disorders. And so the body, while, while consciously I did not recognize I was sexually abused, um, my body knew. Mm -hmm. And the trauma and the immune system, there's that connection that when you've been through trauma, that your immune system does get compromised. That's a lot of what we know in the research. And I think that it's, it's unfortunate because you still, as an adult, a free-thinking adult, still didn't realize that that was what you had gone through. So when, when was it that you realized this happened to me? Yeah, in the fall of 2016, my hero, Jamie Dancher, um, filed the first lawsuit um, against, against Nasser and the entities who enabled him um, and still have not taken any responsibility for it. The United States Olympic Committee, USA Gymnastics have failed us entirely and still continue to fail us. Um, and Rachel Den Hollander, the first woman to come forward publicly, came, you know, there was an Indy Star article, I saw it, my old teammate texted it to me, and the whole paradigm of my life came crashing down in that one moment. But this woman is a huge hero to me, and um, she's amazing. Well, I see a sisterhood here in terms of, you know, just the two of you holding hands because mm -hmm. there, there must be strength there to be able to share your experiences together and, and to hopefully not be judged because that's one of the things when you first came out it wasn't easy, and, and, and I think where I'd like to take this conversation now is this attempt or seeming attempt to cover everything up. And I want to take a really quick break, but I want to talk a little bit about your experiences with that, but also um, how and why this happened after these revelations were made. We'll be right back. Coming up. I got attacked. USA Gymnastics was attacking me, trying to discredit me, saying things like, look at the source, or she just wants attention. Plus. This is not just a USA Gymnastics problem. This is all of these NGBs. This is a Taekwondo problem, a swimming problem, a figure skating problem, a speed skating problem. Sexual abuse is rampant. That's coming up. We're talking to the authors of Start by Believing, John Barr and Dan Murphy, and two of the survivors who stopped Larry Nassar's decades of sexual abuse, Jamie Dancher and Sarah Klein. Sarah, you looked at Jamie and said, you're my hero, because Jamie, in many ways, you were the first one to really come out, and, and you filed this suit because you realized in 2016, is that right? Yeah, late summer of 2016, I decided to speak up and file the lawsuit, and, you know, I... I got attacked. Uh, USA Gymnastics and was attacking me, they, like to the point where um, just trying to dis discredit me, saying things like, look at the source, or, mm -hmm. you know, she just wants attention. Mm -hmm. um, even to the point where they were calling an ex boyfriend of mine um, to get information about like my character sexual... assassination. Yeah. Yes. And I remember my, my attorney would call me, he called me every day, telling me that from my article, another woman has come forward. And I, I don't know why I remember this number, but I remember when it was number 15, when the 15th woman had come forward, I was like, I, I, he's a pedophile. He's wow. a pedophile. And, and thank God that, thank God I, I spoke up. Did because it's just the right thing to do. Johnny and Dan, you did so much research on this topic and mentioned this is maybe the most surprising thing. 
When Jamie comes out, clearly there's an attempt to, it seems, silence her. Yes, spin it. Can you just talk a little bit about how that all played out based on your interviews? Yeah. Steve Penny, the head of USA Gymnastics, was working behind the scenes to, he's a skilled marketer, and he was trying to control the message. He called one of Jamie's former teammates, Tasha Schweikert, and actually had her put out a positive statement about USA Gymnastics on social media. What he didn't realize is she was also a victim of Larry Nassar. And so he, he, he attempted so what, what happens after that? I mean, you're sitting here trying to place a spin on it, and you're beginning to realize you're talking to more and more people that maybe you're trying to put a positive spin on it. Ultimately, this spiraled out of even his control. He had to step down from U USA Gymnastics, and we should point out he's also one of the people facing criminal charges in the ripple effect of this case. He's charged with ta tampering. He is charged with tampering with evidence, ordering a USAG staffer to remove documents related to Larry Nassar from the Crowley Ranch, the famed training facility in the heart of uh, the woods north of Houston, Texas. And let me just read an email. This is an email, and it comes from the USAG lawyers to the USAG president. We can tell the full story of what we've learned thus far. We think it is highly likely that would become a media story and prompt Larry to sue for defamation. Neither Dr. Nassar nor USGA wants the attendant negative publicity at this time. Our suggested alternative is this. Have us call back Dr. Nasser's lawyer. Tell him that a replacement will handle the world championships, and we can work on messaging regarding yeah. that. Again, it, get, it gets back to this spin yeah, they, messaging. Larry they, Nasser was allowed yeah. to put out a long statement. He put it on Facebook saying he was retiring because he wanted to spend more time with his family. He wanted to step away. He was allowed to say he was sick, and that's why he wasn't showing up at gymnastics meets. And because of that, in the state of Michigan, he continued to see patients and continued to abuse young women for more than a year after USA Gymnastics had credible belief that he was abusing his patients. I'm curious because the, the concern in that email I read seems to be about a defamation suit from Dr. Nasser yeah. as opposed to... To put that protecting in the gymnasts yeah. who had been abused. To put He's that in portraying himself as the victim. In yeah. the, the run-up to the World Championships in 2015, Larry Nasser was still employed by USA Gymnastics. Yeah. And they had to constantly explain his absences from competitions. Prior to that email, they came up with this cover story, can't we just say I'm sick? So they allowed him to, to advance that cover story. But with the World Championships coming up, his absence would be conspicuous. So that was the lawyers coming to Steve Penny, the head of USA Gymnastics, and saying, well, we could tell the truth, but it's going to become a really big story, and he might sue us. You know, where in all of that was the concern for Jamie Dancher, right. Sarah Klein? And to be clear, once they learned of the allegations, they took months circling around in an internal investigation. Yeah, they should have picked up the phone and, and called Call law the enforcement. authorities. Call they the took, authorities. It took weeks before calling any law enforcement, and law enforcement, the FBI itself, also sat on it for more than a year yep. as they had credible complaints and, and interviewed witnesses and did nothing with it for more than a year. It got shuffled around from office to office. All little girls time, are continuing to be abused. Before Rachel Den Hollander and Jamie finally stepped forward and took control themselves and said, we're going to push this issue forward because no one else is helping us. There were all kinds of warning signs that were missed. There was actually a criminal investigation and a Title IX investigation at Michigan State University in 2014, and he explained it away with this medical defense, uh, which we now know was based entirely on I lies. think as I'm hearing all of this, it just gets back to a toxic culture that is also incredibly powerful. And it gets me to thinking about any kid competing at an elite level and how in the world did winning a medal, medals are great, but this is your lives. And I'm sitting here trying to think how this organization became so powerful that the very kids who are supposed to be living their dreams ended up living a nightmare. It's not just medals. What happened is it was money. Mm -hmm. That was the big thing that changed, especially when Mary Lou Retton came along and the 96 Olympics became a huge deal. The amount of money that these folks saw that they could make out of commercializing young girls, young gymnasts, and turning them into 
superstars commodities so change their they, perspective and suddenly so it's all about making money making money for usa gymnastics but more importantly for the united states olympic committee this is not just a U usa gymnastics problem this is all of these ngbs this is a taekwondo problem a swimming problem a figure skating problem a speed skating problem sexual abuse is rampant within the olympic movement because it's all about money coming up we have yet to hear, I am sorry for what happened to you. These organizations still, to this day, are participating in a massive cover-up attempt. That's coming up. Can I ask, and, and I'm going to ask the two of you as victims, but also, John and Dan, the two of you, is the culture changing? There, there are divided schools of thought on that. Uh, one is that Larry Nassar is gone, the Crowleys have moved on, there has been a sea change within the sport. I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it I for a minute. Either. Absolutely uh, not. You know, so I think what parents need to do is really ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And if they're being told not to be in the gym, that's a red flag in and of yeah. itself. The culture is absolutely not changing. They have shuffled around leadership. They put out PR statements, you know, that are cliche. They are not taking any legal responsibility. And we have yet to hear, I am sorry for what happened to you. And I want to make clear, too, that while, while certainly I think there's a lot to learn from this story and what kind of questions the parents should ask, the parents who were the, of the women who were abused by Larry Nassar were groomed just as effectively as their children. And they were victimized in, a, in the same way because he was that good of a manipulator. I mean, I think Sarah can speak to that person. I'm sure Jamie can, too, of the way he did that. So talking to some of the parents were probably some of the most heartbreaking interviews we did in doing the book and right. understanding they felt like they let their kids down, but really they were victimized just right. as much as their children. Well, Nassar groomed point. the parents as well, yeah. and Nassar was a very manipulative and very charming person. And yep. I've never heard of a sexual predator who wasn't so, because yeah. how would they get access to victims? Yeah. And it's just amazing that he could fool everybody, even the people he worked with, colleagues, other doctors perhaps, to think that he was somebody of strong character. Before yeah. we go, based on your book, where do we go from here and what are the, the key takeaways that you'd love for people to get from your book? Oh, we're just floored by these women. Um, you know, gymnastics is a sport where the difference between success and failure is razor thin. It's measured in hundreds of a percentile. Um, and for them, for people to go out and compete at that level, having gone through what they went through, is remarkable. For someone like Sarah Klein, who I met in a coffee shop in Wayne, Pennsylvania, who didn't want to give her name in an article to go to being a fierce advocate for victims of child sex abuse, now an attorney representing them, you know, these women are inspiring. And yeah. you know, one of my colleagues said, why do you want to write about such a dark subject? This isn't a dark subject. These are bright lights and they are shining through uh, a really dark part of their lives. Thank you. And I would just applaud the two of you for your courage, and if there were any words that you would like to share that you would like people to take away from, from your story, what would it be? I, was, I, I, I don't want, if anyone out there is going through a similar situation, I want them to feel like they can speak up and that they're going to be believed and I know one thing gymnastics taught me that I think is kind of ironic is making me a robot and making me go through so much. That's why I'm not, I'm not a quitter and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna stop advocating and advocating for the change that needs to happen until, until it happens. Well, I, I am genuinely proud of the two of you. Thank you so very much for sharing your story here with us today and just keep doing what you're doing. And, and gentlemen, thank you so much for writing this book. The new book by John Barr and Dan Murphy is called Start By Believing. It's on sale today. And everyone in the audience, you're going to go home with a copy of it. And if you do fear that you are a victim of sexual abuse, we are going to have resources on our website. We reached out to USA Gymnastics, and they provided us with this statement. We will never forget the appalling acts of abuse that have forever impacted our athletes and the gymnastics community. Like everyone, we were upset and angry to learn about the abuse and the institutions that let the athletes down. We admire the survivors' courage and strength to share their important stories, and we are working to reach a fair and full resolution with them. 
We continue to further strengthen our athlete safety policies and bylaws, including requiring mandatory reporting, setting standards to prohibit grooming behavior and prevent inappropriate interaction, establishing greater accountability and making reporting easier and simpler. We'll be right back. Coming up, you should never allow a coach or a team physician or trainer to separate you from your child. That's next. Based on today's show, I don't feel like a prescription is as appropriate as maybe just a warning to all parents out there. Dane and John mentioned that much of the brainwashing occurred with the parents and that the reason that they allowed their kids in these environments is because they believed everything they were being told. So what are some red flags for parents to look out for? So some of the key red flags are sexual knowledge or sexual behaviors on the child that obviously they're not developmentally appropriate for that age. Also, a lot of regression. So they start to lose certain developmental behaviors they've already acquired, like they start bedwetting again. Oftentimes they'll become very attached to you again, very hard to separate. And also at times they will have many, many nightmares, recurring nightmares, displaying a lot of anxiety and depression. If all of these are happening at the same time, then I think it's really time to investigate further and see what happened. For anything you may have missed on today's show, please visit us at thedoctorstv.com. Thanks so much for joining.